We're back with uh, Coffee with Chris, uh, cased in online here with associate head coach Chris Lowry of the Kansas State basketball team. And, you know, it's been it's been a while since we last spoke, uh, you know, a long, grueling season with a lot of things happening in the world um, and in the basketball world as far as that goes. But first, thank you for taking the time, coach, and, and coming back and talking with us. No, it's been it's definitely been a while. It's definitely been a a different world, you know, since we've uh, started doing this and uh, glad to be back. Glad to talk about, you know, K-State hoops. So, yeah, I mean, first let's kind of like stay on that same page talking about COVID and stuff this past season, you know, the off season was not the same at all for you guys, what you guys are used to for recruiting or for getting a team ready, especially you're bringing in seven newcomers and uh, eight, if you include Casey, easy, easy, into that, equation so how hard was that with the pandemic and everything else you know with seemed like the world was crumbling around us I think the biggest thing that made it hard is that we brought guys to school with with a very hands-off approach to them which in all fairness probably wasn't great but you know you know we wanted to get them back and I think everybody else in the country was chomping to get their back guys back and you know, I think when we saw the NBA keep guys in a bubble and keep guys really just focused on being around just the team, um, mm -hmm. I think everybody was interested in trying to start to try to do that within their own program. And obviously, with so many stoppages and pauses throughout, it was impossible to do that. And um, I think we learned a lot. Uh, but for, for our new guys, um, it was hard for them because we had to spend so much time with them that it made us grow so close to the new guys that uh, because normally that time we're out recruiting and so as a freshman you'll see us in and out and you know in July and then it's camp the month of June so you know all of that we didn't have camp so we couldn't and we couldn't work them out when they came and you know only they could they could only lift weights uh, with whoever their roommates were with you know and and so yeah. that that makes it even different uh, because once July hit and July came around and we were able to get three or four at a time, well, a lot of times, you know, all big guys don't live with all big guys. All guards don't live with – that's just not how it how it is, you know. And to have the different types of guys be with each other, um, it hurt because, you know, we didn't know how to coach them in COVID and we had these big shields and masks and nobody could understand each other and it was new terms and terminology. and. And then by the time you we were talking, you know, and explaining stuff to it in a Zoom and then try to do it in person with a mask and a shield on, it was basically impossible for new guys to really understand. Uh, and that's why you saw the best older teams win, you know, in that because yeah. nothing changed for them. There was no newness and no, no attempt to try to do new stuff with them because they just went from what they knew. Exactly. So, I mean, that's, I, I think it was almost impressive. I mean, I didn't really expect much when you started the season going against a really tough Drake team in Colorado, but it seemed like those were some of the best games of the season, especially for early on in the season. Um, you guys came prepared, it seemed like. Well, we were, our normal start was canceled of what we, what we were going to do because of COVID. So yeah. we couldn't play the teams that we were supposed to play. So we had to scramble and find local teams. And we knew that both of those guys, we knew Drake had everybody, like everybody backed off of mm -hmm. how they finished. And we also knew that Colorado was one of the older teams in the country uh, with a very good, you know, point guard. And in a normal year with that many new guys, absolutely not do we want to play that advanced two teams to start the season. You just, it's not very smart. But in a COVID where we're trying to get to a number of games and just trying to make sure we get, you know, play, because we didn't know if we would make it through January. And we didn't know if there would be another shutdown, you know, uh, collegially across the board, because I think it scared everybody when um, when the Ivy League shut down completely, that we were like, oh, man, if they're they're going to do it, who's going to follow? Yeah. Um, so obviously that scared everybody with the Ivy League shutting down, you know, you know, fall, winter sports and who was going to be next. So we just scrambled to try to find, you know, local games, games that people can bust to. Um, and, and we played them, you know, mm -hmm. to our guys credit, were they ready for it? No, but I think that, you know, our, our, we look at this thing in the future, our younger guys will appreciate what we did for them 
And it sucks because you, you got a chance to lose when you play those games. Uh, and, and them understanding – they didn't understand how important it was yeah. to get off to a good start. They didn't understand, you know, how things could snowball if you don't catch them the right way. And, and the lead up to a season, part of it is playing – Teams that you you might you, you should beat and and we didn't get a chance to do that with them right away. Absolutely, uh, but one thing we did notice in the first few games was Nigel Pack right away coming in, starting and really performing um, at a high level, hitting threes uh, consistently and showing that I mean he's built for this level. Well, I mean he's when I mean, we knew that once we got him committed and we saw how what he did that summer we knew what level we thought he could get to, you know, and he, and obviously he exceeded a lot of things with us, but to see him now, you become like, Oh man, this, like, <laughs> this guy can really get to another level, yeah. you know, and to see his work ethic and, and his ability to come in and be the same way and want to be better. Every time you see him, I mean, that's an impressive trait to have for a young kid because he does not say much. His work yeah. ethic and how he is shows everybody what he's about. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about him a little later on. But, I mean, you get that first win against UMKC, um, a narrow win. But then you go, you know, against UNLV, lose that game. But we have to talk about this one. I don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about it. But what happened against Fort Hayes State? Well, that's another thing. We, you know, as as we didn't want to play that game. You know, that's yeah. a game you plug in with a – with you know, and you, we didn't know anything about him either. So I think that regardless of who you play as an opponent, you want to know something about him. You want to have film and you want to, you want to know who they are. And a little bit of it is, I think our guys thought we were just going to beat them. And to their credit, they came in and played an exceptional game. And we played it like it was a practice, like, okay, they're going to lie down. And they did it. And, mm -hmm. and you learn from that. And you never want to learn from losing. Mm -hmm. And you never want to teach guys the right way from the wrong way. And, and, and that was a clearly teachable point for our guys to know, hey, if you don't show up, this is what happens. It doesn't matter what level you are. Anybody can spank you if you have the approach of arrogance, if you have the approach of, oh, this is a D2. Um, and plus, we should have been playing D2s as our exhibitions. So yeah. they don't know what that means. You know, when we were playing that many young guys at the time, they had no idea what it meant to to play those guys in an exhibition game, let alone one that counted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had to learn from it. And, no, we didn't dodge it. We didn't, you know, and we they, they stood up and ate it. Like, hey, we should – we lost to this team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at it from, from that point to the finish, you clearly realize, you know, they have realized how absurd it was for us to even think that way and play that way at that time. And then it fueled you, you know, to get a couple wins back to back after that. And that's really where I want to talk about, you know, Davion Bradford. I think that's where he started to come out and show that he can play sooner than a lot of people expected, including myself. I mean, Coach Weber said it, you know, time and time again. He didn't expect him to be this good. He had 18 points against that Milwaukee win, um, and then uh, and then went to went to Ames and put up 14. Talk about, you know, those those stretch of wins and just how. I mean, were you surprised how good Davion was this early? Well, I think he surprised us in, when he came. Yeah. The conditioning stuff. You know, he's always been a big kid. And we were surprised at, at where he was in mentally tough and mentally challenging things um, that we – like, he's going to fail. You know, this dude is <laughs> not going to be able to do this. Um, you know, he ran his first mile. And uh, we were, like, betting, like, oh, he's going to walk on the third lap. And, you know, he ran in seven minutes. And we were like, what? Like, and he didn't stop. And then he got it down to 6.30 the second time. Then he got it below six on his third try. And we were like, holy cow. Like, this kid, he's got something in him that, you know, that you can't teach. And, and that's grit. You know, and that's, that's what he had. And, and so we were just happy that he could push himself beyond his body being tired. And that, that was the start for him. What we didn't know is that he could memorize stuff the way he could and understand things. Um, and, and for him to be able to, in this day and age, play as good a ball screen as he defense, defense as he did most of the year, uh, is impressive for a freshman that big to be able to, 
uh, do some of the things he did and be really an anchor for us, uh, you know, on the defensive side. Uh, and, and plus, he does a good job of talking and helping guys. And I think his biggest thing where he really learned was Colorado when a ball screen knocked Nigel out of the game and it was his man. Uh, and he didn't say anything. He didn't communicate that the ball screen was coming, what side. And, it, I mean, Nigel was cooking at that point. I think he had, like, 10 points in a row at that point. And, um, you know, he learned that his voice is important. Him yeah. being there for his teammates are important. So um, he took that and he relished that 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 uh, that that challenge of, of being a much better ball screen defender. Absolutely. And then, you know, uh, yeah, you get that win against Iowa State, which was, you know, big to make sure you guys got one in the Big 12 right away. And then you play Baylor. Obviously, we see what happens at the end of the season for them. I mean, I kind of picked them early on, I feel like, to have a chance to win it all just because of what they brought back and what they had and everything else. But, I mean, when you saw them in Manhattan, you know, live for the first time for that team, what, what were your thoughts? Well, the first thing that obviously me and Coach Weber thought was comparable to his 0-4 team, the three guards. Yeah. And they're, they're good enough to make everybody else good enough. And I think when – and, yeah, there are other guys are good, but you take two of those three off, even mm -hmm. one off, and it's a different basketball team because they all uniquely do something exceptionally well. And, and that's hard to do when you can get people to share the ball and all take their turns uh, being elite in different games. And all three of them scored 30 in a game. So, you know, yeah. we – immediately we said, holy, like this, these dudes are <laughs> – this this team, you know, with a three headed monster out front, as the coach said, man, they're 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 probably as good as our team at Illinois, and that team got second, and this team got first, and that's where you realize we, we were right back then, thinking like defensively and offensively, that team, those three could carry them uh, to where they needed to get. Yeah, no, it was an incredible run by Baylor. Uh, it was fun to watch, and I agree that that three headed monster was nuts, but. Then, you know, you follow that up with uh, two wins. You beat Jacksonville convincingly, you know, um, one of your better all-around games early on in the season. And then and then uh, narrowly get past Omaha, but that's where Selton hit a buzzer beater. I mean, you know, let's talk about the other freshmen, too, that performed this season in Selton. And how big was that buzzer beater for him? Well, I think we, you, you just talked about – we just talked about Drake. We talked about Colorado. And we mm -hmm. talked about Baylor, three NCAA tournament teams. Now you're talking about the teams we actually beat. We should have been the teams in the beginning. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, you know, those guys learning against, you know, guys that aren't in the Big 12 is really important mm -hmm. to growth. Um, but to get punched in the jaw really hard right away, it, as a youngster, you back up and tend to like, oh, man, if these guys are, you know, fighting us, what will the 12 look like? And that, that was a real question for our young guys, like what was the 12 going to look like considering uh, we struggle with the non-com and, and other teams. And um, Selton, obviously Selton had huge growths, huge drops, huge growths again. And, uh, you know, he's, he is a young man who's not afraid to take risks and challenges. And sometimes, you know, as a coach, it drives you crazy, but his, his stubbornness is why he's good. And the things that he sees uh, on a ball that he throws, you know, to the other team or he throws away are something that the receiver didn't see. And that's his progress as an older player is understanding not everybody sees what you can see. Not everybody sees the next cut that they should have made, but they didn't. But you threw it where they should have gone. That's a that's a very good trait. And and he has it. Uh, but what I think that is the most impressive, he's a bulldog defender. And I think that, you know, the people he really uh, guarded and, and took pride on that side of the ball, it changed us. And, and, and him understanding that the best guys in our league play both ways. And we convinced them, look at Baylor's guys. You know, they had two guys up for National Defensive Player of the Year. And when it was all said and done, and, I, and you know, Butler was in MOP of the Final Four, but Butler probably is the most important guy on that team. Uh, I mean, I mean, Davion Mitchell, he's, he's the most important guy on that team when it comes down to I it because yeah. he completely would take out their best player and then he would explode for four or five points that would dismantle you and then he would take out your next best player when he came in. So uh, I, I think convincing him like, like that the best guy's got to do both mm -hmm. and him understanding what that meant um, 
it caused something, a fire to be lit in him and him wanting to be that. Absolutely. So now we hit January and obviously this is where, you know, the 13 game losing streak span month and a half started. How, I mean, how hard is this for your team and, and how do you keep them focused? Cause I think there's a lot of things in play here that it's really impressive to even keep a team focused through that. Well, I think that it's, it's hard, but I think, you know, coach Weber did an outstanding job during that time of, of not letting it get away from our guys because during that time also, Nigel was out and we felt we were playing, you know, pretty good. If we look at Texas tech at Texas tech and see where he was going. And then he completely was, he took three shots in the second half and he came to the bench and said, I'm, I'm exhausted. And then we get back and he's got COVID. We're like, wait a minute. So we thought like, and you think back, he had, he probably had got it during the game and started the effects in that second half or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was done. I mean, physically, I mean, and, and then him sitting out stunted our growth because we felt we were turning the corner and getting better yep. um, with him in the game. Uh, and then also, you know, Luke not practicing from yeah. June all the way to January and then, you know, getting three days of practice before we threw him in the fire at Texas didn't help us or him either, mm -hmm. you know, because – Obviously, that had a had a huge thing to do with it as far and, and as well as Casey being injured as well, coming back and then throwing him back in the mix. And so we really relied heavily on the freshmen and, yeah. you know, really trying to get those guys to help us overcome that. But uh, tough times. And we always have to have tough times don't last. Tough people do. And, you know, I think our guys did a great job of fighting through that losing streak because none of us have ever been through that. You know, none of us mm -hmm. have ever experienced uh, – that and 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 really um, to rise from it and to finish how we finish is a credit to the kids and also a credit to coach um, during this COVID time and and no practices and, and you know trace testing getting and having six dudes and you know we only missed one game and you probably should have missed Oklahoma State too at home um, we missed the next one the Iowa State but you know, just having not enough guys to do anything. And, yeah. you know, that helps you when you're older because you know what you need to do to get better and you know what you need to do to win. Mm -hmm. But when you have those pauses and those slight things and guys out of practice that are young who don't know how to do it, it hurts you when they come back because, number one, they have to not only have to focus mentally, but the physical side of playing at the highest level can overcome you, you know, if the mental side isn't there either. And, and that happened to us. And we struggled during that time emotionally, mentally, physically. Um, and I think the positivity that coach showed with those guys every day and, and pushing them the right way. And, and, and just we spent so much time <laughs> with them. And, and the coach will tell you, like, we were not – it was not basketball coach. It was, it was Grandpa Weber a lot, you know. It was it was that. I mean, he did a he did a great job taking care of his his babies, man. Because there was times when during that streak when there weren't dry eyes in the locker room, mm -hmm. and you know, was it because of losing or was it because of the long streak? Uh, I don't know, but the doubt creeped away with that. And this is something that's very different. Our doubt started to creep away as that streak got to 10, 11, 12, and thirteen. Then we we finally turned the corner and Nigel got back full strength and mm -hmm. our older all those young guys kind of established okay we're here this is who we're going to be um, let's just move forward and and that was that was a very trying time for them but it was it was just being there for them for as far as the coaches and gosh we watched more film than I've ever watched with mm -hmm. players and that's something that we've always take pride taken pride in but those young boys wanted to watch a lot like because they didn't – they thought that's what you do, you know, which mm -hmm. is great. And, and it helped us in the end in the correcting things. So um, you got to give a credit to that young group of coming in and watching film and getting better. And I got to think all oh, that's going to help them for the next year too, which we can talk about more. But um, first, you know, during that streak, you know, I, I want to talk about Nigel's career high, 26 points against Texas A&M. Obviously a game you guys wanted to win badly. Um but just talk about how important that 26 points was for Nigel. I mean, we, we knew it was going to happen. We, our thing is 
if in a regular year, that would have happened a long time ago, you know, just because people don't know who he is mm-hmm. and he gets that flick going and he starts making bombs, which we know we've seen it. Imp- like it's impressive. And to see him do it there, we were like, okay, like people were like, Oh my gosh. You know, we, do, we, we see it every day. We know that, that yeah. he's capable of doing that. And to see the types of shots, the step backs, you know, the, you know, the crosses, the floats, you know, playing off the ball, the catch and shoots, you know, the pushes and transition into three, like that's who, you know, the free flowing way he can play and play very efficiently Mm -hmm. that that same way uh, was important to him and us just to continue to move forward. And then did you think maybe that turning point when you guys were losing, this is what I kind of thought, I saw a three game span in February, uh, Texas Tech, you played them tough at home, lost by 11. Texas barely lose to them. Should have won. I mean, should have won that game. Only lose by three. And then Oklahoma State on the road only lose by seven. Did you kind of think that stretch was kind of a turning point? That stretch was huge. But like, I, if if he doesn't go out with COVID during that stretch, we think yeah. it would have happened sooner and, and allowed us to turn the corner mm-hmm. uh, a lot quicker than what we did. But I think. When you're trying to get comfortable with yourself, it helped everybody. Davion got better during that segment too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he we went to him more. We we tried to you know establish him more uh, because he became better with his back to the basket. Because if you look early on, he could really catch lobs. You know, he yep. wasn't very good at, at deep post ups. Even if he caught it around the rim, if he couldn't dunk it, he struggled with it. But I I think you saw his his left hand get better with his jump hooks. His right hand get better with his jump hooks and that comes over time. And, and that's something that we kept telling guys, don't, don't get caught up in, you know, where other people are, run your race, your process will kick in differently, even more so than some of your teammates. So their process may be happening right now. And yours is, is going much slower, but in the end, if you trust, it'll happen for you. So mm-hmm. I think you saw Davion become more a dominant catch and to a post move guy for us during that same time period. And then uh, the 13th loss was to Kansas, which was a tough one. But then you, you get the first win in a long time against TCU on the road. I mean, how, how major was that win? Well, it was good in this in instance, you know. And, and we haven't talked about Mike, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> because the brunt of all this fell on his, his head mm-hmm. because he's the last guy left. He got a lot of grief, um, you know, from outside and suffered a lot of grief in, internally that he put on his own self and um, to see him fight through that and to really try to keep positive every single day when you know the right way to do things and they haven't gone that way. Mm -hmm. And that was the, I think those three games, like you said, you know, obviously, and and really starting with TC Texas uh, A&M with, with, with him, he needs Nigel too, because Nigel helps him and to see, like might get better during that time period and him and become much more effective, a leader and a personality that, that needed to say more that happened during that time period too. So that, that in all instance helped Mike really grow within a bad season, you know, and, and during that 13 game, he, he took it harder than anybody because he's, he was a part of the glory days and, uh, that's a big part of why he came back to get it, to get it back. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that it's, it was helpful for him. It's helpful for us. And it really helped us grow as a team. And then, I mean, yeah, you see, you start, you get that first win and then you go back home and you invited number seven, Oklahoma who was on a role that made me think they had a chance to, to, you know, end up second in the, in the league behind Baylor at the end of the year. And it seemed like you guys broke Oklahoma because that's when their that's when their demise started to happen. But you guys pulled off an incredible win at home. Yeah, and that you know that's again you know like you said it kind of start rolling down you know as you know rolling the other way and 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 uh, Mike was obviously exceptional that day and mm-hmm. he played really hard. But but it's the it goes back to TCU. It goes back to Texas A and M. We didn't finish the game. At TCU, we finished the game, and we won how we win. And sometimes it's important for – and everybody wins differently, but to for – and we'd say that to them. They never knew it. You got to win how we win. And from that, there's a lot of rewards that come from it. 
TCU, and then Oklahoma, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, we can beat anybody now. Like they just felt that way and, and not only, you know, compete, but, but actually beat. And to play how we played against Oklahoma, uh, and we were down five late. Six yeah. after a free throw, and then we go down, and Mike makes some plays, and Nigel throws some good passes, and um, and we had some good D stops by Selton. Selton just really got underneath their skin defensively, and it, you know, obviously a technical in the first half uh, really showed his level of how hard he was playing and getting underneath Reeves' skin, and uh, you know, our other guys were good too. Davion was really good during that, you know. And he's guarding Manic, and this is what we, you know, for people to – everybody knows who Manic is. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the grand scheme of things, he should kill Davey, huh? And, and that was our biggest worry, you know, him getting a bunch of threes, Davey not getting where he's supposed to get defensively as a helper and still close out and contest his shots. And magically, we talked about Davey being Davey getting to the magic level. He was defensively was at that magic level. Mm -hmm. And then we threw it inside to him and he made him take him out, which, you know, that doesn't happen to them during that time, but that's kind of the blueprint of what happened later. People start going at him in yeah. the post and not letting him just float around and shoot a bunch of bombs on you. You got to go at him and make him guard in post D and Davion was, was, was really, really good uh, in that game with his back to the basket uh, against against um, Oklahoma. And then Mike finished it off. Those plays at the end of the game, oh, yeah. um, you know, those are, those are big time. And that's, that's how we win. Toughness, grit, timely offensive possessions. Um, and I think we can get there and grow because now you got a really good post presence in, in Davion and Casey moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Mike and Mike and, Nigel, obviously, a backcourt for the, mm -hmm. you know, where you feel much better moving forward. And then, uh, you know, we can talk. I want to talk more about all these guys too here in a second. But let's just get through the end of the season where you know you lo you lose to West Virginia. I mean, you're battling COVID injuries, everything else. Uh, you guys battle injuries and stuff too, going against an Iowa State team without receiver Bolton. You get past them, win that game. The regular season ends onto the Big Twelve tournament. Where are the spirits of the team at this moment in time? Well, we we just felt, and it's so weird, Nigel didn't play against West Virginia, which mm -hmm. is, when you think about it, it's like, he's what you need against West Virginia, a guy who can score the ball, draw attention. Um, you know, we make fun of Nigel. It was a sunglasses game. and you know, <laughs> Virginia, He was a cool guy. And, and he, he got, I mean, you don't understand, his, his eye was disgusting. And, oh, I, I believe it. Yep. And it was, we were like, people want to make jokes. It like got you know, punched yeah. and it was crusty and it was like disgusting. <laughs> it looked like, it honestly, looked like we weren't taking care of him. So that's really why we <laughs> got to, can let his mom see this. <laughs> you know, we got to make sure. And, and he did not want to wear those sunglasses. Uh, that's but, funny. You know, he did and it was funny, but it was not funny <laughs> to score, but. The, the whole – and we had some good – we had good times in this tough year, and that was definitely one of Nigel getting flashed with the sunglasses looking like he didn't care, which was the exact opposite uh, of what was yeah. really going on. He was dying inside. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that going to the TCU game, we felt good. We felt good going to West Virginia. We just knew Nigel hadn't practiced in a couple of days, and we were just trying to see where he was at, and it progressively became worse. And, you know, worse to look at. And, you know, it was like you look at him and you're like, ugh. Like you <laughs> – it was like that. And you don't want to ever look at a kid and with a gross face and that's yeah. kind of what was going on. But to get there, we, we felt, okay, <clears throat> we just have to compete how we've been competing and this thing will take care of itself. Absolutely. So, yeah, then you, you get to the Big 12 tournament. We're almost to the end of the season. You beat TCU for what feels like the 50th time in the Big 12 tournament, and uh, and then and then narrowly lose to Baylor, who had you know played you guys really well early in the season, but now you guys come back and uh, played them really tough. Uh, what what was what was everything that encapsulated Kansas City for you guys? I think the biggest thing is that we we got away from a high major team in TCU, you know, by grinding them out and then making shots like. We, we really started to get it defensively, you know, and that's been our thing is to be one of the top defensive team 
in the country, mm-hmm. you know, year in and year out. And to begin the season, one of the worst, you know, in the three hundreds. Uh, but then during that, the last month, we we got our efficiency way up in the last three weeks. I think we got to third in the country defensively, which is where we know we can get with this group. And to see how they were guarding and they were taking personal pride in, in understanding what works and what doesn't work for a team and how you stop a team who does this well, uh, I think that really helped our guys have a level of confidence. And when we got up 20 against TCU, we were like, wow. And, and our guys, we, they kept wanting more in the timeouts. You know, what's next? What's next? And that, that's when you know you got a team, when they really aren't looking at the score. They know they're winning. Mm-hmm but they want to continue to play hard. And, and that's a, that's a good sign. And then that, you know, that video in the locker room was really special. I feel like afterwards it, they got put out on the, the, the Twitter, I mean, with the team, I mean, what was that like that moment in the locker room, you know, last, t- last time after a game, you know, basically it almost seemed like you guys were pitching, Hey, stick with this team. We really see good things to come. Yeah. I mean, and, and it was, that was not a recruiting ploy because we knew it was coming with the, the future of being able to transfer and do whatever you want yeah. uh, with no penalty one time. It was, you guys are this. Yeah. You know, understand that now you took what it, now you understand what it takes to get to this point. You can be that all the time. And, and I think, you know, we were just referencing them to understand that you are good enough to get here. So, I think those those things that were, were really helpful for that group is to play that way and know how we played Baylor at the end. Nobody else played them mm-hmm. <laughs> that tight at I the know. end yeah. like, with what they did in the tournament, how hard they played. And, you know, we made it hard for them to get their stuff, and we, we were hard to guard for them. And I think that when you saw Davion, you know, you saw how well he played, and you were like, oh, my goodness. Like, mm-hmm. These interior guys may not score, but they are great defenders. Mm-hmm. And, and to see how he, you know, got his career high, um, different ways, dives, post-ups, putbacks, physical play, like him knowing that I could be this uh, is huge for him. Huge. And, and I think, you know, obviously Nigel playing well against him. He did not play well against him either time. Uh, the one thing he didn't do, which is hard to believe he didn't turn the ball over against them at all. I think none the first time and they maybe won the second time. And, you know, that's what they were going after him, like literally trying to chop the head off. And Mm -hmm. and it it was Mitchell every time trying to take the ball from him as as much as possible, (laughs) which he does at a high rate, but to see him do what he did that last game and how he scored. And those weren't easy shots. I mean, a lot of them were on people. A lot of them were tough makes and um, to see how we played as a unit defensively um, Luke was really good obviously you see Selton be a tremendous defender defensive stopper Um, and then you go with with what Casey did that weekend and how well he was to get what we got from him and Davion against TCU almost you know a high double double is is what they can actually do every Mm -hmm. game and that's what we talk to them about is like, you guys can be a two headed monster. That's unbelievably uh, tough to deal with, whether it's together at the same time or one of you guys coming in for each other, um, you know, you guys are dominant and, and be that way. So I think it was good for them. And it was good for every, the fan base to see that the guys didn't quit in purple, mm-hmm. you know, because in a, in a season like that, it's so easy to go over. And we saw it happen in mm-hmm. our league. I mean, you know, we were not along with losing streak and so were they, but our guys fought our, fought their way out of it. And, and, and it's a credit to them, but it's also a, a credit to coach, not, not, not stopping coaching them and, and being taking the heat and, and just telling the guys, well, you got to trust me. What I'm telling you is going to flip. And when it did, um, there was a lot of emotion the right way. Um, learning that, gosh, Lee, this is, if I had just did one little small improvement, mm-hmm. we, this could have happened a long time ago. And, you know, just good to see our guys compete that way. And good. It was, it was a good, good time in purple because we knew if we can play like this against Baylor after we were scared of them the first two times, 
um, and and just got punched in the mouth both times and and really gave up. We averaged 103. They averaged 103 on us the first two games, which is incredible. And I mean, it's mm-hmm. not like nothing I've ever been a part of or Coach Weber's been a part of giving like teams average that against you uh, in a two game series, <laughs> and, and and they did and. And our guys fall back to their credit. And then, you know, I just want to go in depth with every player that's on the roster right now on campus um, and how you think they did uh, this season and what we can expect from them from the future. We already talked about some of these guys a lot, but just to go, you know, talk a little bit more about Nigel and what we can expect for him in the future. I mean, when you look at how he can score, the sky's the limit. And, you know, he knows he's got to get to the free throw line a lot more with, with being that good of a shooter um, and and great touch with both hands, he's got to get fouled way more. Mm-hmm. And, and understanding um, – he understood he had to get physically stronger as well. So when you combine those two with him getting more free throw attempts, him, you know, getting stronger, I think you'll see a, a much better version of him just because he's been through it. You know, and and he's been the top of the guy on the food chain. He didn't really know it at the like, and we just had to say, "Hey, Nigel, who's guarding you?" And we watched film the next day, and he'd realize, you know, Marcus Garrett was on him most of the time, or Butler was on him most of the time, and it's just like, you know, those are the alpha dogs on the other team. You know, you got to understand where they see you and where their coaching staff sees you. If they can snuff you out, then they got a chance to beat us. So. You have to understand what that means. And so it, it was good for him. And then Davion, I mean, you talked a lot about his defense. You know, that's something that I think people kind of overlook, too, and want to want to already write him off as a defender. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm already taking from you that the future for him is bright on both ends. Well, he's got to rebound at a much better clip, you know, and, and not be if it's coming to me, I'm getting it type of guy. And that's, you know, as a big guy in high school, guys tell him don't chase balls because you'll get fouls. You know, you don't want him knocking people over, chasing rebounds. I mean, we yeah. want him to knock people over. We want him to chase stuff. And I think he slowly started to learn how to – that there are other big people like him on the court, and it's okay <laughs> to be physical. You know, and, and, and him, um, you know, he's working really hard on his touch. He's mm-hmm. working really hard at being a better free throw shooter because if he can improve his free throw shooting – He's got a chance to be a very special player because he's learned how to get fouled now. And yeah. I think that's the, the biggest thing for him was learning, you know, even though I'm this big, I, I have to play this big. And early on, he would ball up when he got the ball and become six, three or four. Mm-hmm. And you saw him miss a lot of layups, get a shot block or get stripped down low. Whereas later on, that ball was high. He was keeping it high. He was finishing high. And, and those are the things you want to see in a big who's, whose maturation is started to slowly seeing. Sometimes it's, a, it's the next year for, mm-hmm. for those big guys as they develop. But his was within the year. He understood um, after watching a bunch of film on what he needed to do. By the end, he was telling me what he needed to do in, in certain situations. And, and that, was, that was very good to see that he, that he could tell his mistakes uh, from his good plays. Do you uh, kind of side note question because we'll get to Casey here in a second, but like if he didn't get hurt, do you think Davion would have started that early on? I mean, it's when you when you look at it, you know, Kate, we knew Casey got hurt before the season, and mm-hmm. his whole thing was, Am I going to do surgery now? I'm going to try to play through this. So he had to decide literally two days before, you know, Drake, Colorado, and he's like, Man, you know, I don't know what to do. Uh, I think I want to try. Mm-hmm. And he looked really sluggish because he hadn't been practicing because he had gotten hurt and he wanted to try. And then that, that, that we allowed him to try. And after that, obviously he had to have, he played a couple more games. he had surgery, but what it did is that frying pan, pan, pan that frying pan got hot for Davion. He had to play, he had to, yeah. you know, he, and, and it's, it's sink or swim. And, you know, he responded in a, in a very good way. Um, and that's a, that's a hard question to ask because yeah. if Casey would have done what we thought he could have done pre-injury, it would have been tough for Davion to have that much experienced minutes. 
but mm -hmm. injuries are a part of the game. And yeah. sometimes guys flourish when other guys are out and they don't, you know, when they're not around to steal playing time from them. But now Davion, you know, we played them together some and Casey mm -hmm. came back and, and, you know, they could, we could do that a lot with them because they're both very smart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when you have them on the court, they have to touch the ball. And we didn't understand that during that time. They have, mm -hmm. we have to make them pay when, make other, our opponents play when we're playing both of those guys together. So I think we've learned how to do that now and understood um, where the ball needs to go when we're super big like that. And uh, to Casey's credit, he didn't stop working. He didn't pout. He came back and played hard and rehabbed. And, um, he was as much a coach for Davion as anybody on the staff. So mm -hmm. that's what type of, you know, human being he is. And that's why we feel so good about those two together. Um, being a, a, not only a big time combination when you combine their, what they can bring, but also on the floor at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, since we're talking about him, what do you, well, yeah, well, I mean, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but Casey, what do you think about the future for him and, and what do you see for him? I think staying healthy. I mean, he, he, he's, uh, you know, some of his physicality got taken away mm -hmm. because he was, he didn't trust, you know, where, where he was physically, yeah. you know, and I think when you're used to being a power guy and a bully and now one of your wheels is wobbly a little bit, he was like, okay, I don't know, you know, cause you saw it in the, in the, in the big 12 tournament really good against TCU, less than 24 hours, struggle. You know, he missed mm -hmm. a wide open layup against Baylor, but it was just because, you know, he didn't feel comfortable. And, and I think his ability to feel comfortable is, is our ability to feel comfortable too, because he is very smart and he's a great teammate. And you want to see him do well just because of, 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 of how he is as a person and a teammate. And then the side effect, everybody who's here knows how hard he's working to get his get his physicality back, to get his strength and his knee back. And and so, you know, we're excited for him. Absolutely. And Celta Miguel, you know, we talked about his defensive ability. It's obviously there as a freshman, which is really impressive. Um, and, you know, he showed a lot of really good offensive ability at times. Just, you know, had to get a little more consistent from deep. I mean, would you would you agree with that? I think, you know, part of his thing is is learning to play with other good players, too. You know, he's yeah. been the best guy on his team, and now all of a sudden these other guys show up, and they're pretty good, too. Mm -hmm. And he has worked so hard on shooting the three, you know, that, that he, you know, and he's a very confident person, and he's like, not not again. You know, I'm going to – and that means that I'm not going to miss a bunch of threes. And, and he's, he's worked diligently on his shot, and I think – it looks great when you look at his shot. It doesn't. You don't say that. I don't know if we could ever fix that thing. Yep. He, you know, he needs you know repetitions the right way, and shooting the shot, the same good shot every time, and and following through all the stuff that you preach about shooting the basketball. He's probably tired of us, and especially Coach Weber just attacking him <laughs> about <laughs> shooting the ball better and what it could do. You know and and I think when you look at him, um, continue to be a driver, continue to get fouled. Uh, and everybody know, you know, he's a right hand bandit, like, you know, getting that mm -hmm. left better. Um, and, and, and that'll definitely improve because everybody was forcing him left at the end of the year, not letting him get back to his right <laughs> hand. So, um, you know, and, and understand, like we told him, man, scouting report, scouting report, man. You can't get mad at the other team for understanding mm -hmm. what you don't do well you got to get it better. And, and so he's been great um, this all season as far as getting better, pushing himself uh, to make tough shots. And, and really, he's been focused on shooting a three. I mean, this might be a stretch. Obviously, Wesley Wandu was a great playmaker at the, at the wing position. But is, is Selton a guy that can be – I mean, we saw some solid playmaking from him, dishing it to Davion, you know, down low every so often. Is that something he can get really good at? Right. I think so. I mean, that's who he is, really. He really would like to play make more than score. He loves he loves when other people make shots. If you could only know how many times he yells at Nigel, shoot it again next time I throw it. <laughs> so, you know, he understands. And 
and he has a thing where he he's so competitive that he wants everything to come through him and 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 him understanding that allowing somebody else to make a play for you is just important and i think that's what we got him to understand later on in the season is it's okay for somebody else to make a play for you and you to shoot an open three. There is nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think his confidence, you know, when his three, when it started to go away, he wouldn't take those shots and he would just dribble the ball out of an open shot for himself. And yeah. those are the ones he can't pass up and the ones he's got to make. Absolutely. And then let's talk about Mike. When did Mike, you know, tell you uh, he was going to come back? And, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, obviously he was put into a role. He wasn't, you know, supposed to play this season. And I think he did it admirably. And how big is that for him going forward, that experience this year for this next season? I think it was a struggle for him um, in the beginning, understanding what that meant and um, trying to learn how to do that, try to learn how to deal with a bunch of young people who don't understand what it takes. Um, and I think that really – that pressure hurt him early, and he, and he played that way. I think, uh, you know, by the end of the losing streak, he began to, to snap out of it and be what we needed him to be and, and to, to say what he needed to say mm -hmm. to people. So, um, and that's when he started playing better again. And, you know, the timelines, whenever, you know, he plays well, our freshmen play yeah. pretty good, too. Because now, you know, when you look at the sky, scouting report, people are going to say, we got to guard Nigel. But when Mike goes off, now that guy shifts. And now Nigel's got a different guy who we can get off on. And now that guy, now there's a change. Now Selton can get off, you know. And mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, the reality of it is um, be who you are and make the plays you're supposed to make. And, and I think that with Mike learning to understand, to take and make the ones I'm, I'm supposed to get, don't worry about – making a bunch of them but make the ones you're supposed to make and then from there that that is leadership in itself because it teaches the other guys the right way and the right mm -hmm. shots to shoot and and i think that he did a great job down the stretch of, of being himself um and really um, not settling for threes a bunch but being a driver too because he is athletic and we you know we tell him your athleticism has to show every game Mm -hmm. that you're not just a guy out there bombing threes. And I think you saw him do all those things down the stretch uh, for us, and you know, attack and close out with, with drives and, and really, you know, showing our guys how to attack certain things without having anything run for you. And, and he was very helpful with our guys on that. And then, you know, you mentioned Luke Kazuki a little bit earlier, but obviously, yeah, he got thrown into the fire. Um, Coach talked about in a regular year where this wasn't a free year for him. He probably gets redshirted with the injury because, you know, it, it held him out for half the season. I mean, just talk about uh, all of that combined and why that may have, you know, resulted in, in the kind of season we saw from him. And, and what do you think he can bring still with a full off season and everything else there? Well, I think the biggest thing is when you talk about him, he's actually our most decorated scorer coming in a couple of 50 point games and ice. Mm -hmm. Like he, he, and what he's not, he's not just a shooter. Um, but absolutely he would have been red shirted on a regular year. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have played a dude in January after injury. We just said, Hey, you're going to, you're done. And what he can do is he can really defend at a high clip. He can really, really guard. And we didn't know he could do that. Yeah. So, you know, we knew he could score the ball, and it kind of transitioned him into being a defender only as a freshman because he completely lost his offensive uh, confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a couple segments. Texas A&M, if he hits two or three, we win the game. Oklahoma, he hits a couple. We, we get that lead extended. Texas, you know, he misses, you know, two or three wide opens. And I think though, what you'll see of him more is more ball handling more attacking the rim um, and just more playmaking stuff, which is what he can really do. And, and, and again, alongside of being able to defend. So, I mean, he's getting stronger. His thing is he had to get stronger. His thing, he had to get in the lab and, and, and get that J ball back working because it's broke. And, you know, that, those are the things that, that it, he, he's a worker bee. And when you see these guys show up every day, it's the same ones. 
you know, out of those young guys, it's Selton, it's Luke, mm-hmm. it's Nigel, it's Damian. Those dudes come. Early. They they show up every single day the way you want a young group to show up without having to call them and tell them you got to stay after you should be doing this they do what they should be doing without you consistently on their tails about doing and i think that's what uh why we're excited about him because he's tall he can defend um he didn't shoot it the way we anticipated but his value is more than that anyway so he's going to people are going to see him score the basketball not just from three well yeah I mean, that, just looking at his stroke, I mean, every time he shot it, you think it's going in just because it is a pretty shot. It's definitely uh, not broken by any means. I think, you know, it's just a lot more to it. And you just talked about it. So uh, Montavious Murphy, another guy dealing with injury, uh, you know, tough go for him because it was obvious he was not feeling the same early in the season compared to what his freshman year was like. So what was he dealing with and how's the surgery come along? I mean, he was dealing, you know, with – am I going to try this or am I not? You know, and I think that was the biggest thing for him because, because Monty is an, an elite defender. You know, he mm-hmm. can really do some things and he's an, he's a, a, a high hustle guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he plays hard all the time when he's on the floor. Um, and we put him in at the end of the Drake game and in a play where defensively he normally gobbles that person up. He didn't try we knew that something was wrong again with him and he just put his head in his hands when he came over and he said, it's, I got it. We, we got to have another look at this. And we knew at that time what that meant. And then he had another surgery and he's out. And, um, you know, he's, it's unfortunate when things like that happen to good kids, you know, when, when stuff happens to people who are trying to make it right and it just seems to go wrong for them. Um, that that's, Monty, you know, to a T. Um, but, you know, this spring has been a good spring for him, you know, because he's been in the gym, you know, where he hasn't been able to do that. Uh, just working on, on movement, working on his game, working on um, his weight. He's been back in the, in the weight room. So we're, we're patiently waiting for him to get back to health to where he can provide that af- big athletic long guy Mm -hmm. Uh, that has hurt us the last two years. Yeah. uh, And then let's talk about, you know, two more guys before we get into like transfers and stuff like that. But Siri Lewis, um, obviously freshman coming in during the headlights, but still a a bunch of athleticism. Talk about uh, what he could bring and bring to the table in the future. And, and what did you see from him in practice and stuff like that? Well, the one thing that, that pops out when you come to practice or when he plays extensive is his athleticism is eye popping and he can get going and make, you know, he's, he's a very, it's, it's a unique situation for him is he can score the ball in a lot of different ways with both hands. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like when the, you know, for him, he has to slow down when he plays because the Mm -hmm. lights come on and that thing, everything is moving so fast. Um, that when he makes a mistake, then he changes and goes the other way. You know, then he mm-hmm. goes everything so slow. I think him realizing that college basketball is hard and realizing where you have to be and that we need his athleticism because he, he, could, he could provide so much uh, for us with his, with his athleticism and his size uh, and his toughness. And then Carlton, um, you know, seemed like on the defensive side of the ball, Carlton, you know, struggled a little bit. But offensively, it seemed like if he had the defensive side figured out, he could have been a major piece for you guys this season. I mean, what, what's he all about? I mean, you know, it's, it's injuries with him, you know, and it's stuff that, you know, he can't control. It's like you said, it's a part of the game for him. And uh, was back, hip, and then knee. It went all the way down one side there, you know, and now um, – when you see him shoot the ball, you really – you're like, man, that is a beautiful stroke from a seven-foot dude. Um, <laughs> offensively, absolutely. He knows he has to get stronger, a lot stronger, uh, mm-hmm. to be able to compete at this level. Um, you know, it's – and he is a person who understands who he is. And as a young player, and he said, Coach, I just stood in the middle of the zone, man. I just blocked shots. And he goes, these dudes is come putting their bodies on me. It's a little different. And that's the truth. He's never – 
had to deal with that because he's been in his zone. They trapped and, you know, he never got one-on-ones basically like people can get on you in our league, even in zones. So him learning um, the ins and outs of being a total basketball player uh, were important this year. And, and he didn't have a lot of success as much as he wanted to, but you know, as far as eagerness to please and get better, I mean, there's nobody that wants to be more more pleasing and better than him. So he he's going to really, we can keep him healthy. He'll make a huge jump. For sure. Um, and I can't wait to talk about these guys closer to the season too, to see where they're at when, you know, more workouts and, are done and stuff. But yeah, let's move on to some other stuff. I mean, obviously, Dejuan, Antonio, Rudy, they're out the door. They leave. Um, was it pretty clear to you and the staff that you needed to, you know, make a push, in, a pretty heavy push in the transfer portal? Because it seemed like you did. <laughs> yeah, we knew we had to get older, and I think yeah. that's important. We need to get older um, along with our young guys. <clears throat> I think it was important. And we needed older guys who had played a lot. You know, we needed guys who had played um, – games at those guard spots you know we really were looking for older older to bring in two older guards that have played a bunch of games and that's that was our approach and that's what we we went and did and and the other thing was that they had to be able to shoot the ball um, you know consistently over their career and that was the other good thing is that we got we got a little guy who scored a bunch and, and, shoot, and can score a bunch of different ways um, who is a high assist guy as well and then Mark and and, and Marquise and then and, and Mark Smith, we we get a a chiseled veteran who's been a ten point a game career on the high major level his whole career. So those things are important as far as games played and 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 being good guys in the locker room. Uh, and the last thing is is ultra high competitiveness in practice, which is something that we needed too. Is is to be able to have guys who been through tough practices and still come out and be successful so yeah mark smith let's talk about him more that's that's your guy so take me through uh how that all worked out and uh you know obviously you've been on him since high school um and what kind of role yeah go ahead i know him since he's a little kid you know? <laughs> oh yeah we had played together in college and um mm -hmm. you know it's it's so funny that we've been trying to make this thing work for a long time and for whatever reason uh, we've not been able to do it until now. And this is the third, we talked about third time's a charm with him. And Mark Mark can do a lot of things with the ball. He can really shoot it. He can really pass as a high IQ. And that's what we're excited about is, is that he brings um, not only um, experience, but he brings the ability to make threes and, and the IQ that you, that you love in an older player. I mean, I guess this – I feel like that one's the easiest to, to predict his role. I feel like he's instant starter and big, giant role. I mean, is that too early to say that? Well, I think it's – you know, I think he want, doesn't want it to be given to him like that, which is good. I think he wants to come and earn uh, whatever he gets. And But when you have that much experience, that means you're going to play. And that's what we expect from him is, is to provide uh, some leadership experience and you know be a great kid and and, and help us uh, move it forward and that's what we've been talking about move it forward the right way and, and mark definitely fits the bill for that and then shane goes and grabs marquise noel you know little guy out of arkansas little rock people want to point at his size and say you know and discount him right away i mean i've seen his i've watched his tape i think a lot of people have the guy can play i mean what do you think on that i mean he's been little that way forever and he's he's always been able to score over around through and getting away and he's always been on high caliber AU and high school teams he's been the best guy with several other high major dudes to go with him so I think that's the thing about it with him he ain't gonna be scared I'm telling you so one thing our people can expect is a tough little ornery dude who's going to come and win over a bunch of uh, people in our fan base with how hard he plays and how crafty and, and how emotional he is as a player. And, and, and those are things when you're a little guy, you have to, you have to be a pest. And he is, he's a pest. He's a, he's a guy who people are going to love because he's going to come off the court and be the same size as a lot of our fans. And they're really like, yeah. Oh, he's that <laughs> little and he can do that. So he's going to have instant, instant uh, 
celebrity once people see how good he is. Yeah, I mean, that's something, I mean, you brought up the pest part. I think people won't even know. I mean, I try to tell them, you know, with what I write and stuff, but people don't read what I write. So I try to tell people that he's a defender too. He knows how to play that, that side of the ball too. And I think that's something that is really exciting for what you guys like to do. Um, is it too early though to project his role um, or can you I do mean, that? I think, I think it's, you know, we have two point guards who can really handle, pass and score. And I think both of them are going to be good defenders for us. And anytime you can play multiple guys who can dribble, pass, and shoot, Bruce Weber's going to do it. And, you know, I think his role will be defined as much as, as he wants it to be because, you know, we're going to have some knockdown dragouts in practice, which are going to be huge for the development as our guard group as a whole. And I think he's going to be a big part of, of helping Nigel Pack get better and Nigel Pack helping him get better. So, that side of it, when you look at it that way and you can see growth from both of them because of them going at each other. And, and we, we talk about, you know, Baylor's situation um, because Coach Weber talked to Alvin Brooks about the Illinois situation. When Alvin said, how come those guys were that good? And, you know, and Coach Weber told him and Alvin translated that to there and they played one-on-one. They did a lot of stuff where you didn't have to tell them to be, to be good, but when you have highly competitive dude, that translates the game. And that's what we're trying to inject into our guard group to make them highly competitive, but great teammates to each other. Absolutely. And then the final piece, you know, also, you know, was Shane using his East Coast connections to find Wake Forest transfer stretch for Ishmael Masoud or Masood. Uh, three years of eligibility left, you know, fills that final scholarship with a, with a player that has two years played in the ACC. Uh, it seems like a slam dunk to fill your final scholarship with. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been wanting to face up four since. Um, Sir Dean Wade has left the, the building. He wanted a guy who could stretch it and make threes consistently. And, you know, he can. He can flick that thing. And he's got good size. Um, and he, and he, he'll come in ready to play. And that's what we also wanted. He wanted a guy in that big forward position who would come in who's played in a great league and had some great battles um and and has had success and you know he's going to bring in uh a lot of experience and also the ability to shoot the ball from different places uh, and that was important for us too that um you know where can he score from um can we run stuff through his catches and all those things pointed to yes so that we were definitely excited about uh, him I guess I mean I'm going to ask this here and I mean this is something that you probably have a better idea way later down in the off season. Um, but you guys played a bunch of small ball this season probably more than you have you know in a long time I mean you mixed it in throughout your tenures but this was a starting lineup of small ball most of the year do you think you continue doing that I mean you have the versatility now where you could plug the suit in, in the starting lineup yeah we we can play a lot of different ways now and I think that's vital to our improvement is not being pigeonholed and having to play a certain way out of necessity, but being able to play that way on a whim or if we need to play that way, or if we want to play bigger, we want to play smaller uh, and still not lose effectiveness. I think that's the next step in, in having Ish and having Max and having um, Logan. You know, when you look at, at what we improve, with who we sign, all those guys are good three-point shooters. Yep. And then you have a mega athlete in Max as well. So we address the big, the big athletic wing too. So when you look at Max, you look at Mark, you look at Marquise, and you look at Ish, three, three guys who shoot three-pointers, who can make them uh, regularly. And that, that was part of what we needed to drastically improve as, as our mm -hmm. shooting. Um, and let's say if we've taken four high school kids, you can't trust that high school kids are going to all have the maturity and the confidence to take and make those shots. And that's why we had to get older. I want to talk about Shane Southwell here in a second, but first let's talk about the signees since you brought them up. We haven't really been able with you and me talk about Maximus. You talked about him a little bit right there, but explain more uh, what he brings to the table. And, I mean, he did have that tibia injury. I'm just curious if that's any kind of concern. 
tibia injuries like that are usually for super explosive people. And, mm-hmm. and Max, you know, he had that injury. He jumped over two people. And one of them was a seven footer in a dunk contest. And, you know, he was like, if we'd have known like then that he had that injury during that time, we would have, you know, shut him down. And, yeah. um, you know, he is very explosive. He's a junkyard dog. He's one of those dudes you're going to be able to plug into different spots. And uh, we think he's going to be a great defender. Um, but we need we needed big, strong athlete on the wing to fight some of the other guys, TJ Shannon, you know, you know, guys like that, and mm-hmm. you know, the Jalen Wilson. We needed six five to six seven guy on the wing who could stop that other guy on the wing. Yeah. And we addressed that with Max. Um, I guess one one other thing I wanted to ask about him. Or no, actually I was gonna he, yeah, he told me that November was when he injured that tibia and they played on it the rest yeah, of the season. That's incredible. He did. And, and ju- you know, we just, in the dive state, if, if that thing would have snapped, then this thing could have been a really, really long uh, rehab approach for him. Mm. So, you know, him him being – and he's a tough kid. And that's what we absolutely love. You know, a kid with that level of toughness uh, – and he he's he's a he's he's a guy who can finish, you know. He's a guy if he gets close to that rim, I mean, they're gonna be talking about head tap because that dude is gonna put it. He he is a, he's a high flyer, and, mm-hmm. and we're excited about him and what he brings to us. And let's talk about Logan. I mean, the guy that you recruited. Um, you know, we we talked about him a long time ago, but now you know he's played a, a season up there in Wisconsin and. And been able to do things since then. So, I mean, what do you what are you guys bringing in in freshman Logan Landers? When you look at him, you just say skilled. Like, I mean, he can make fadeaways. He can make catch and shoots. He can make shot fakes and the one dribble pull ups. He is a dude who doesn't know how good he is just because he's had such a short lifespan and playing the game. Uh, but that if he gets some things right out of the gate, he's going to make it hard for people for us not to play him. Mm-hmm. because of how skilled he is and how deep he can shoot it from. And, um, and Logan is a dude who we are constantly in, in touch with just because he loves to he loves to know what's next. He wants to know what he needs to get better at. What's next? What do I have to do? And, uh, he's already searching, you know, for what he needs to do to be a good player. So that that excites us. Instead of saying how much I'm going to play, what am I going to? No, he doesn't ask that. He's, but what do, what do I need to do to get better? Mm-hmm. You know, that's a great sign for a young player, um, and who's constantly trying to build upon who he is as a player, who he is as a, how he fits into what we do. Um, we're we're just excited because again, he can really shoot the ball. And then this is where I want to talk about you know former K Stater, well K Stater now, but former player Shane Southwell now coach. You know, he took the job last March, March 2020. And so now it's, you know, just over a year since then. And now he's got three commits in this 2021 cycle, um, two of them coming late with Marquise Noel and, and uh, Ismail Masood, and then also Maximus Edwards, obviously, all, all got in with his, his East Coast connections. I mean, how important is, is he to your staff right now, this early in his career, even though it's super, super soon still? early in his career. I think his importance is more so on the daily grind of being here and, and, and coaching players on a daily basis because he gives them something to reference on. When you can point at those banners up there and you can point at, you know, being a part of two Big 12 championships, he, he talks about it and he is about it with them. And I think that's huge. And, and then to be able to adapt, get back over that area where when we got here, there was three New Yorkers on the team. Mm-hmm. You know, we got here, and they're vital to, to us. And um, J.O. Omari and, and obviously Shane. Mm-hmm. So now to get back over there again to get a, a, a East Coast City kids and, you know, the level of toughness that they bring and how hard they play and compete. And, you know, he has somebody to talk about Harlem with when now that all of a sudden he's he's got <laughs> some guys that, that, you know, that understand that. So he's been very important and. He's been very professional in his approach to to being who he is. He doesn't take it for granted um, because sometimes guys will go home and chill, and he's he's taking it the other way. And 
gone home and, and worked extremely hard to make it a better situation. And I, I think it'll show up quick. Shane gets a couple of transfers. You land Mark Smith, maybe the you know biggest time transfer in K-State history, if, if not at least in your guys' tenure. Um, do you think this is like a one-time thing where you really heavily go into the transfer portal? Is that all just kind of up in the air and you see what happens? Well, I think with the new rule, nobody knows. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, I think we would take – if you look at Mark Smith and you look at um, Mike McGurl, they'll both be gone next year. Yep. I mean, why not get another older two guards again, you know? Mm -hmm. Or you just hope that Nigel – um, Selt and, and Luke are that much far advanced where you don't have to. You can go drop down and they can be the juniors and now you got some freshmen. Mm -hmm. That's the way you really would want to approach it. But if if need be, I think we would definitely – I think everybody would take a kid who averages 15 in, in another high major league who has one year and I think everybody would take that as long as he fits and is into the system and the culture. Yeah. So now, I mean, obviously we're, we're in uh, April – Got, kids are still finishing up semesters there and you're still around guys. Uh, what have you guys been doing in this time? You know, everyone outside of the transfers that are already on campus. Well, I think, you know, we, 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 were, we were really focused on making sure that being here was your most important thing. Mm -hmm. If that wasn't the most important thing for you, then, then it probably needed to be a change. And, you know, now that we have that, the most important thing is getting them better. And, you know, getting people better is something we've shown. We can develop guys, but they got to want to be developed. And they got to want to be coached and, and helped. And, you know, when you look at where we think this core group is now can get, it's exciting for us. Mm -hmm. And it should be exciting for our fan base because those guys are all come from the success we had at the end of the year. Those guys are a big part of it. And, you know, now to have him back and Mike, you know, get his – basically his first year was basically – most of it was redshirted anyway. Yeah. So to have a, a real fifth year from him, we expect him to be a, a much more um, reliable and, and confident guy. And I think that's what, what he needed to hear from us is that we expect you to be reliable. We expect you to be confident. You don't have to be the leader, though. And I think that took so much pressure off of him. And now, I mean, it's old Mike McGurl. He's happy. He's competing. And it's almost like he's being the leader without us even telling him because he doesn't feel the pressure to be that. And I think that's a good thing for him. Seems like everything's pointing up. Uh, so, the, yeah, the roster's loaded up now. I mean, it seems like you guys have about 10 guys you could turn to at any given time, if not more than that. Um, so what's the plan of attack this offseason once you get the transfers on campus in June? The, pr the plan of attack is to let them play open gym. Shit, we haven't – they didn't get to do that the whole summer. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's another thing. If you're new – if you're coming to a new situation, you don't even know who your teammates are. Yeah. You don't know where they score from, what they like. You just can watch videos of them. And I think that – I mean, I've never – as a player, there was never ever in all the time when I was still playing – that we couldn't play open gym. There was no, or three on three or twenty one or hustle or whatever. Like you could always do that. <laughs> the pandemic changed that drastically, yeah. where guys couldn't play one on one. They couldn't play, you know, full court. They couldn't get real runs in unless they were sneaking and taking a chance of getting the virus. And, and you know, we didn't know what that meant. So we did a good job of keeping our guys locked up. And that, that's sad to say because you never. But there are times when, you know, our guys were in the regiment of coming in, getting their, their Gatorade buckets and going to the locker room and only undressing with a certain group of people, then coming out, and then the next group would come in. So think about how long it takes for everybody to get to practice. Mm -hmm. You know, when you got 15 dudes in there, it has to be, you know, three people increments to get practice started. And, you know, this is like the behind-the-scenes stuff. So the trainers yeah. have to take turn, the girls and the – so we really tried not to practice when they did. So we would have would have the training rooms to ourselves where only a certain group of guys can be in there. And then they had to be out completely. And then you had to sanitize that area. Then you had to let another so – I tell you, our trainers had absolutely long – like Luke Sauber is a spot in heaven for him, man, because he really had long, extensive days. 
Mm-hmm. And was it fair? No, but I mean, you got to give him credit. He did a great job with with the circumstances that we had to deal with and, and the just the care we had to take every day and the amount of testing per week that we were doing and we're still testing to, you know, to this day. And even though guys have had the shot, so um, just, just that side of it, that was the toughest. The getting to play every day took way longer than show up at practice, get some shots up, let's practice. It was your group can come, your group can come, then your group can come, and your group has to leave out of there. We have a, you know, that great locker room that the freshmen didn't even get to dress on the other side just because they had to, they had to stand a separate part. We were just yeah. like, we can't take advantage of none of the amenities of why this thing was built just due to circumstances. And, you know, hopefully getting back to normal and playing, have an open gym and letting them have fun um, and not um, having groups limited to certain people would be great. Do you think there's going to be any, any of those limitations this year? Does it kind of point towards uh, that you guys are going to be able to play where you want, how you want? I think we're going to be able to have open gyms, which is great. And, yeah. you know, that's a huge part of a, of a Hooper's life is mm-hmm. to talk about who he killed on Monday and then on Friday, that other guy kill you, you know, so that the whole, you know, playing well in the summer, translating into playing well in the fall, spring and into the season, you know, you didn't know because we didn't know what everybody could do together. Yeah. So now, I mean, you've had a full year of not being able to go out on the road. And I don't know if you're going to be able to go out on the road this summer, but there is the no visit rule that's going to be, you know, taken away in June. Um how is that going to change with recruiting and what are you guys planning on doing for recruiting this summer? I think it, it's, it makes an unofficial visit. It's not official. So, okay. I mean, it, there's still some limitations, but mm-hmm. the one thing that it does make better is that we can use the football games again, yep. but still being safe, we don't know what that means. You know, are you mm-hmm. going to only visit kids who have been tested? Are you only going to visit – kids who are juniors or sophomores because of where our roster is right now you know those are the things we we gotta we gotta talk about and think about moving forward but you know football weekends are huge for us and and just just opening up your campus again to say hello to a good player is important because you know these zooms are great but you can't teach culture over a zoom yeah you can't teach how to do – you can show them on tape, but until they actually do it, and, and one-on-one Zoom's talking about how we talk and then getting them on the court and like, man, Coach, I didn't know you meant that when you said that to me. It's it's really important to, to understand because some guys visualize stuff and can do it, and, and, and some guys are really reflective and have to think about it a long time. And some guys are just responders, show them one time and they can do it. And you know we had a we had a combination of both with with a lot of our new guys. Um, just like now, there's no limitations on workouts, so we're it's been great that, a, that we've gonna we got a lot of chance to spend one on one time with players, you know, and having one player just work out with a coach, just really flourish on some of the things they got to get better at, and 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 just to spend time with them. I mean, there's guys in there right now, music's playing and guys are in there working at it. And I mean, it's not the the tense 13 game losing streak right now. Mm-hmm. It's the brighter side of getting better. And and that's where, you know, our guys are, are really excited about. So, yeah, you've been able to take advantage of, you know, being able to stay around for the whole time. You're not allowed to travel. Yeah. But will you be able to allow to travel this summer or is that not a thing yet? It's supposed to be a thing, but we'll see how it shapes up because certain things were already canceled. Yeah. Now we'll see whether what what picks them up and will they allow us to go to these things? Because there's nothing sanctioned on the books yet, so we you mm-hmm. know got to be a mad scramble to figure some things out in July and in June. So and June's right around the corner, so we'll look forward to that. Because uh, one of the players asked me, so. Normally, you wouldn't have been there in June and July like that. It's like, no, 
<laughs> and they were like, man, I don't know what I would have done if you guys were, if I couldn't see you guys every day. And it was, but that was a part of all they had was yeah. us. You know, they couldn't meet new people. Think about it, when you went to college and, and somebody said, don't meet anybody. Don't talk to <laughs> girls. Don't talk to anybody. <laughs> and this is, this is kind of ironic. We had an Easter brunch for our players at my house. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's funny is kids, and it was the first time that they signed autographs. Easter, our freshmen, the first time they signed autographs wow. from kids. And that's a huge thing at K-State. That's a huge thing is to, to be able to go to the tailgates and to be able to go to see people and people scream your name out and take pictures with you. But, you know, when those guys told me, I didn't, we didn't do that. I, I was shocked. And it was like something you take for granted. And, 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 no, you, but we didn't have camp either. Camp is a huge part of, you know, we have camp and we have a big autograph sign after every, every, every camp we have. And mm -hmm. it didn't, we didn't have camp. So um, something as small as a, as a young kid coming up asking for your autograph, they did it at Easter <laughs> after their <laughs> freshman year. I mean, that's, that's awesome. I, I think, you know, it, it's a wild, wild time. You guys got through it. It seems like the team got through it. A lot of tough times, everyone involved. Um, but now it seems like things are on the up and up. And I think that's exciting. And we can wrap this thing up with, you know, some final words from you if you want um, before hopefully we can uh, talk again this off season and, uh, you know, dive into how guys are looking in workouts and stuff. Right. Just bleed, just bleed purple with us, man. That's all. Just bleed purple. It'll get better. That's right, Coach. Thank you so much for the time. Associate Head Coach for Kansas State Basketball, Chris Lowry. Always appreciate it. Coffee with Chris. Thank you so much. Thanks, Flando.